Right, good afternoon everyone. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. Very privileged to be part of this incredible lineup this year. It's really good. So thanks for coming. Right. This afternoon we're going to be discussing the 2022 bond.edu.au uh, Drupal rebuild project that we went through together and really how we stayed sane for 14 months. So let's crack on with it. First off, who are we? I'm Griffin. I'm an agile delivery manager at Previous Next. I'm a chicken crimpies kind of guy. I like sweet chili red rock deli chips and marvelous creations. I don't really like lollies. I mean, I don't really like chocolate. That's pretty much lollies. So Nathan, he's the head of enterprise application services at Bond University. He's more of a barbecue shapes kind of guy. Uh, he prefers salt and vinegar chips and he likes dark chocolate. So that's probably everything you need to know about us. Great. This afternoon, we're going to be covering a few things. We're going to be going through the original project goals of the Bond University Rebuild project. So why did Bond do this in the first place? And also, was it successful? Then in the meat and potatoes of the talk, we're going to be talking about the key challenges of the project uh, and what we did to survive those. And then finally, we're going to come back with some strategies and tools that we used to stay sane for that period of time. As you can see here, we've got a takeaway on the side. This one is, what's your favorite flavor of shapes? So if you drift off during the talk or you lose concentration or you want to come back to a thought, those will be there. So there is a correct answer for this, and it's chicken crimpies. So, uh, and then finally, if we've got any time left at the end, but we do gather on a little bit, eh, there'll be time for questions. So, Nathan, what were the original project goals of the project? project goals. Thanks, Griff. Uh, hi, everyone. So first, I want to talk about when Bond uh, started its Drupal journey. So in uh, 2014, we built a small internal team and we started work in a project phase on our main Bond website. Uh, then early in 2015, we went live with that. Uh, in the following years, we built some smaller subsites and some smaller web apps on there and we continue to support that. Um, during that experience of uh, managing the site, uh, I got some understanding of Drupal core, uh, how modules work within Drupal and a good understanding of UX concepts and web development technologies. Um, and this really helped me get a good understanding and prepare me for this project that we're going to talk about today. And then in uh, 2021, with the imminent end of life of Drupal 7, we started planning our new website. Now, this was not just going to be a simple upgrade and move from Drupal 7. Uh, we were going to start completely from scratch. Um, so what were the main drivers for this project? Uh, so for us, We'd been running Drupal 7 uh, on-prem for about seven years. Uh, we'd been running it on our on-site uh, campus data center, and we were looking to move, for, move to the cloud. So this was a big change for us. Uh, we'd had no UX updates in that uh, seven years. And as you know, seven years is a long time in the UX industry. So the industry had progressed a lot since then, and our site was uh, looking a bit rough around the edges. Uh, we have program pages, which is our main, uh, our main focus when we were trying to promote content. And we did have some structured con content on there. We were moving uh, content from some uh, external sources on there to display that. But mostly it was really an incohesive experience. Uh, there were contributors from different business units and they were contributing content on the different uh, program pages. But we were looking for an overhaul of those and provide a good experience for our prospective students. And lastly, we were starting to dabble into reusable content. We had a few simple blocks and tokens, but we were wanting to expand on that and build on this with our new website. It was a very basic architecture. So what did we end up with? Uh, so we are now running on Drupal 10. We're running on a scalable cloud and we are running on resilient infrastructure and there's less reliance for our Bond infrastructure team to manage the site as a whole. Uh, we went through a complete design and brand refresh, so you can see some of the images here. We've got a bold new design that has been released. Uh, we now have a very much improved uh, mobile experience while still maintaining a very unique desktop look. Um, we have a lot more structured content for our program pages. So we are pulling content from three different systems now and displaying it on the website. Um, and this has a very com uh, cohesive experience as students move between program pages, they can see the specific data points in the same areas. 
and we have really improved the way that we use reusable content. So we are using a create once, publish everywhere approach. And you can see here some of the content types that we're using. So we've got uh, some uh, card types here that we're using, reusing across pages. We have uh, forms here and we have different call to actions. And so we update those in one place and they're reused across the website. Overall, we're very happy with what we have now and it's been a big step up from what we had previously. Um, implementation wasn't a walk in the park though. Uh, we did encounter some challenges and uh, we're gonna talk about those now. Griff's gonna start first. Fabulous. Great, the hard stuff. So, what was difficult about this project? Well, the very first thing from my perspective was the A word, Agile. So, everyone's had a nightmare implementation of this before. Everyone does it a little bit differently. And this was a very uh, loaded word for Bond University in late 2021. Uh, Bond is a traditional, large scale traditional organization and similar to a lot of higher education and government clients, they use waterfall, they love it, they live it. But going into this project from management to the team down, they knew that they, if they wanted to build something that was ready and for students and uh, fit for purpose, uh, state of the art was the phrasing, uh, they had to try something a bit different. So they had this mandate and this drive to do something different and to use agile, but they were entrenched in waterfall. So that was a key challenge of the project. So the first piece of advice I got from my team when trying to solve this problem was, don't be a zealot. Bond was keen to learn, but this, wasn't, this change wasn't going to happen overnight. Previous next, we've used Agile, primarily Scrum, for the better part of 10 years. So we're comfortable um, working and adapting it to clients, but you know, we just had to be wait patiently for that. Um, so the first piece of advice I really remember and talking to Nathan before we went into an executive team meeting was, don't mention story points. And he's probably right. I think the main piece of advice we had to go into this was that we had to remain rooted in reality. We can't, you know, be a bit airy-fairy. They were executive teams. There was long-term engagements. They weren't going to come on board with that process. So, and what I really mean with that is there, there were things that weren't going to change at Bond. They had steering committees that were happening quarterly. There were project working groups that were happening monthly. So our main process in thinking around this was to agile around it. So, what do we do? So we work within bond structure. So we started small, we started with daily stand-ups, everyone's done them before, but as a team that got us in comfortable working together and um, it sort of broke down barriers and ways of working. So it made everyone a bit more comfortable making decisions together and also it eased that reliance on, oh, we've got to wait for the next project working group coming up in a month and that would just take too long. So start small, get the team comfortable working together is a great idea. Then we introduced a few more agile ceremonies each sprint. So we introduced sprint demos. So um, stakeholders from those other, those, those other meetings could come to the catch ups on Fridays and see what we'd been working on. But it would also give Bond's team updates that they could take to those larger sessions. So this would be Friday morning. And then on Mondays, we'd have our sprint planning sessions to let everyone know at Bond what's coming up, what things we needed from them to work on. So nothing too revolutionary so far. But really for this project, the main thing that made it tick were retrospectives. Um, and that was a really big turning point for everyone to get it. I do want to fess up at this point that I personally haven't valued retrospectives too highly in the past. I've always found them quite confrontational. And um, from a project management perspective, they're just another meeting that you need to book in to everyone's schedules. Um, but it really did prove invaluable and improved the project week on week or fortnight on fortnight, sorry, um, and gave everyone the chat of a chance to talk openly after quite a hectic sprint demo on Friday morning. So, as I said, the intention of these sessions was to be honest and transparent and uh, catch up about what was effective for the last fortnight and what was proving difficult and sort of identify those things. So we used a fairly standard of template of what went well, what didn't go well, and we also added a shout outs column that said, gave props to someone who went above and beyond that sprint. So Nathan from a technical business requirements or a tester that had got through 45 previous next tickets in one week, that was great. Uh, 
some developers that did a great job. So um, from a tooling perspective, we used a thing called Retrium for this, R-E-T-R-I-U-M, but there's a dime a dozen tools for this. And the main reason we use an external tool was to keep me, or get me as a project manager involved and I didn't spend too much time just coordinating the whole thing and starting timers and all that sort of stuff. I think the big benefit of retros is the blind voting as well. So you can see the black dots at the top there, they're anonymous. So if someone isn't as comfortable speaking up or voicing their opinion, these voting, these voting dots make sure that we surface and then we discuss things that everyone wants to discuss. So as you can probably tell, I don't shut up, but a lot of people in the project didn't talk as much. So this made sure that everyone had a voice. So that was really important. So really with retros, we, we said that sort of fortnightly regular catch up and it really made sure that we were improving each sprint. So as you can see there, the main way we dealt with bonds in experience with Agile or long-term entrenchment with Waterfall was time. This didn't really happen overnight and each fortnight we improved um, you know, as a team and getting working together. I think another thing to really call out is that Bond was engaged. It wasn't a thing that we were dragging them through and saying, guys, you have to do Agile sprints, Agile ceremonies. They wanted to do this from the beginning. So that was one of the key challenges of the project. What about you, Nath? Okay, so from the Bond side, one of the uh, first things that we realized early on is that we didn't have, uh, we hadn't put enough, enough effort into understanding the technical planning that was required. Um, so when we built this project, uh, when we started this project, uh, we'd really under, underestimated all the effort around planning and decision making during the sprints. Uh, when, we first started the, when we started the project, uh, there was really two clear phases. We had a design phase and then we went into an implementation phase. For the, the design phase, we brought on a creative agency. Um, they came on board and gave us an overview of the education market and really led in that design and uh, imagination area. And then they also spent some time understanding our core products, which is our study programs. From there, they went into detailed designs and then they built uh, components and then the associate, associated annotations from that. And then at the end, they handed over a gel. Uh, from there, we went into the vendor selection mode and we went through that process, chose a vendor, and then really we just went straight, straight into sprints. Uh, and what we realized earlier on is that during the design phase, we'd spe spent a lot of time visualizing the content and looking at how it would uh, appear on our new website, but we hadn't spent enough time uh, understanding and investigating the technical feasibility for this. And a big part of our new website was going to be improving our program pages. And as part of that, we were going to bring more structured content from external systems onto the website. And we have our own uh, integration development team here at Bond, and they were working on API feeds to do that. Um, so to do this, we needed to uh, make configuration changes and actually build out new applications to hold this source data. Um, and while we were doing that and building, uh, starting the, the building process for the website, we were still configuring and building these applications. Um, it was like trying to build a plane and take off at the same time. <laughs> um, we realized we had a lot of technical planning to do uh, to catch up with from our original plan. So we originally planned to do all the uh, program page development early on in the piece, uh, but Bond, we just weren't ready. So we had to readjust and look at how we could make this work. So how did we do that? Well, we spent some time uh, just together as a group and we made some decisions around how we would make this work. And together, uh, we realized that making this work in an agile way was, would be the, mess, the best solution for this. Um, so as we started doing configurations and designing the applications to host the data, the integration team were working with stakeholders to understand how we were going to format the APIs. And then we were also working with previous next to look at how that structure would link into the sections of the program pages and the components in Drupal. So we really were working in an agile manner to, manner to del deliver this. Uh, the next biggest challenge for Bond was resource resourcing. So to say resourcing was a challenge for us would be an understatement. 
Um, uh, after we moved out of the design phase, uh, we lost three of our key team members in the web team. They went on extended leave and a few sprints into the project, we lost our project manager on the bond side. As part of this, uh, during the implementation, we also had to talk with our various subject matter experts out in faculties and other business units. And they are all, all very busy. They have their own jobs that they do day to day. So we had to um, arrange time to meet with them. We had to foster collaboration and we had to help push them along in the decision-making process. Um, in the first few sprints, we realized that we had a lot of all these gaps. So we had to uh, stop for a minute and look at how we were going to facilitate this to get to the end of the project. And what we did is we regrouped. Uh, we looked at all the responsibilities that were required for this project. And we looked at the capabilities that we had inside the team here at Bond. So what we decided to do is that we, uh, we formed three product owners and we decided to work as one product group. And together we uh, collaborated and communicated and made decisions as one uh, to help us get through this project. So those were some of the challenges that we encountered. The big question is, did we stay sane? Well, just how do we stay sane? Let's go through that now. Griff's going to go first. So, yeah, those are some of the things that drove us insane. So how do we stay sane? So the biggest thing from my perspective was that we made sure that we were using, or for your projects, make sure you're using good communication tools and processes. So these are some very specific things that helped me stay sane. So. We use Slack all on the project. We use it every day. We use it during development. We use it now in BAU. We use it from nearly every client. Um, I know some of you will be mandated or love Teams. Uh, so all of these tips will work for you, but um, this will help you through your projects. So number one tip I have is please, please, please use threads in your projects. So you can see here, Anna's asked a question. We've got six replies. If I need to look back and see, oh, what happened there six months ago, I can see immediately and search and find that. Especially when we're in project mode and we had, you know, 13 people talking in a Slack channel a day and it was all going crazy, you needed to be able to digest and reference that and see who was replying to each other. So if there's anything from this talk, please use threads in your chats. Um, another recommendation I had and it came out of our retro process was that when team members came out of deep work or they came out of an afternoon of meetings, they didn't know who'd been responded to or if the sky was falling or if these were just questions that could be done later. So what we did is we implemented an emoji key for our channels. So you can see there, Anna's asked a question. It's a question mark, but for the team, a question means that this isn't world ending. You can come back to this day, the day after. Um, just let me know that sort of response. Nathan, a bit more dramatic. We've got an exclamation mark there. It's blocking things. We need to sort it out immediately. Uh, and then Daniel's got an I. It's more of an FYI. There he's doing a deployment. More that this is happening, let you know, continent to stay out, all that sort of stuff. Rocket ship means it's gone successfully. Um, things like that are really handy to be able to just pass a channel and lots of information really quickly. Um, we've got green ticks. That just means that it's been actioned. You don't need to come back to that thread. And then we've got a few down the bottom. It's a fire, an ambulance, an alert, and you can probably guess what those are related to, <laughs> which we definitely use. I just didn't want to use an example of it. <laughs> um, so, oh, actually, one more thing. On these, if you use threads as well, you can connect Slack and Jira, and it's really handy for saying the immediate, is there a ticket related for this? You can create a ticket based on a thread. So do that, that's a good idea. Um, so speaking of Jira, and really any project management tool, they'll sort of overlap. Um, I've got a few tips for you to stay sane. So the very first thing from this perspective is have a conversation about how you use your project management tool first. Everyone's used one, everyone sets them up a little bit differently, everyone's swim lanes mean different things. So just have that conversation um, up front, it'll save you, pay dividends. So here's how we set it up for the project. And we added a few extra columns to make it a bit more specific, but the projects where you've got 10 plus swim lanes are a bit of a nightmare. Is that in QA round two? All oh, that's a pain, don't do that. So here's what we do. Um, ready and in progress, pretty standard, you know what they mean. 
Uh, needs review meant that it was in code review at previous next end. Needs QA meant it was testing on uh, the Bond University end. Uh, needs work meant that it was had either side had feedback and you needed to address that. And client approve meant that it had passed testing but it hadn't yet been deployed. So that's kind of how we, we had a session. We just talked about the columns we needed to have and what the definitions were. We got through 14 months with only those seven. So you should probably be fine with that many. Um, also a good fit of feedback that we got from one of our retros was previous next is doing too many tickets and then throwing them over for testing. And it's just making an avalanche of stuff that would come over in the middle of each week. So what would happen is we would have 10 plus tickets in that needs review column. We'd then pass them all over for QA in one deployment. And then the poor business analyst or whoever's assigned for QA testing those would just be, be hit by about 45 emails. So that was difficult to deal with during the process. So what we did is we implemented limits. So you could see red on that column. We've also got it on the in progress column. And it essentially just says to the previous next team or developers, don't start any more work. Either do stuff that's in progress, do something else, because it just at, once Bond tests everything a week later, it comes back and then we've got in progress and all of last week's tickets. So tip there. Um, we, I strongly recommend this is to use a ticket template. The next question after is, this a, is there a ticket for this? Is there, I can't see what you're seeing question. So using this, make sure, and setting this as sort of a ground rule on all projects, make sure that you get information that you need to set things up. So we use a title, description, and expected result just means what I'm seeing and what I expect to be seeing. And you can usually figure out the issue pretty quickly. Steps to reproduce is very important. Sorry, I've really, I'm going very fast. I just want to have more time. Um, steps to reproduce and also we've got images, uh, sorry, screenshots and video attachments at the bottom. So with all that information, especially post project in BAU and you're doing, you know, managed services type stuff, this helps you diagnose things really quickly, prioritize, estimate, all that sort of stuff. So I really recommend that. The last thing I would recommend is to do a one page sprint report. So Bond as a traditional organization that a lot of reporting mandates, they had to come back each sprint up the channel and say what we'd been working on. So every Friday morning, as I mentioned, we would have our sprint demos. Then after that, we would have our sprint retrospectives. And then Friday afternoon, every this dust had settled a bit, a little bit, I'd work on a sprint report. So all this really says as a team, what we'd worked on and what's coming up. And if, you, if you're too busy or you can't be bothered to even read the words, we use traffic lights to just say if there's any dramas in any of the categories. So if there was ever an at risk or a critical item that came up or one of those sections, we could just jump on, the, jump on at the next sprint. So um, I can give you this template, but it's very simple. I recommend something like that. It's also really handy when you're doing a talk a year later, you can see what you got up to each sprint and you can be like, hey, that was a nightmare. Oh, <laughs> that one was really good. Um, so I really recommend just a one page report for your projects. That's a really good tool. So those are some of the ways that I stayed sane. Um, but Nath, what about you? Thanks, Griff. So I'm going to take a bit of a different angle uh, for this part, of the, uh, this part of the talk. I wanted to talk about how you can master character traits or emotional values to help you get through uh, difficult conversations and projects. Um, so character traits and you know emotional values aren't something that we talk a lot about in the development industry and I know it's starting to grow a little bit more but I think it's really undervalued and I think we all have an opportunity to learn and grow from it. Um, so what I'm going to do I'm just going to talk about some of the character traits that I uh, realized that I needed to work on to make this project a success. Um, so the first one is adaptability um, and in this project uh, both uh, the agency and the client really had to work on adapting uh, how we worked to get to the end goal. Uh, so from the bond side of things we uh, as I said mentioned earlier we were struggled in some resourcing areas so we had to regroup and we had to look at how we would step into different roles and this was challenging for some people as they never really worked in this way before and they had to step up um, and understand their area a lot more and become decision makers in that area. On the previous next side, they had to learn how to accommodate multiple uh, product owners. So 
when we started the project, they told us that they're used to working with one, and then early on, uh, early on, we uh, put it to put it to them that um, that we had to work as three, and they were able to adapt to that, and we made it work. Um, the other thing that they had to do is our understanding of Agile was very immature, so they had to guide us um, and help us adapt to how we work in this way and really support our capabilities. So how do we do this? Well, we had to put aside our previous thoughts around how roles would work um, and how we would work together to get on. No, no, it's back. How we would get uh, towards the, uh, the end of the project. But we had to still do it within uh, setting healthy boundaries. We didn't just do whatever we could to make it work. Um, and the best way to do that kind of leads into my next point, which is humility. So I know this is not um, an issue for developers in this uh, talk. Look, I would just, I'm sure you've all mastered it here. So just take some notes and take it back to your teams at home and um, you know, you can just share it there. But uh, seriously, um, I've really learned to value humility as a, uh, as a character trait as I've learned and grown in my career and uh, built more uh, experience in leadership um, and management. And I think um, that hum being humble, learning humility, learning to be teachable uh, builds character uh, and it grew leads to greater respect, which leads on to greater, greater influence. Now, how you use that influence is a completely different talk, but uh, I can still see that progression that I've experienced in my career. And when, I've, when I really think about how we use this within this project, I think about how we worked as a team. And what we really had to do was um, set aside our own personal ambitions or what we thought as what we'd achieve as goals uh, for this project and just focus on uh, supporting other and complementing each other's skills to get, uh, to get to the end of the project. When, when you think about your career, especially in you know, development, there's always uh, new, uh, new languages or new frameworks, new versions of things and you kind of plot your career along those kind of things. And you don't really think of, you know, oh, actually I need to learn how to practice more humility as part of something that I want to develop my career in. But I think that's really important and, I, and I've learned to value it over time. Uh, a lot of people kind of think humility is a weakness, uh, but for me, it's the ultimate superpower. Um, and my last point is really around challenging ideas. Now, people can find this uh, really confrontational, but I've found it can be really effective. You can see um, in different situations how there's some people who don't really want to challenge ideas, and then there's people who just love doing it and will do it just for the sake of doing it. So learning how to balance that is, is really key. In my uh, coming into this project, I had some Drupal experience, and I thought that things would go a certain way, um, but previous next had to challenge some of my ideas. And when we were designing solutions, I had a chance to challenge them back. So it was a bit of back and forth, but we got there in the end and we built strong relationships out of that. Um, so yeah, that's really the main ideas around, uh, you know, some of the emotional and character traits that I've learned out of this project. Oh, actually, there's one more. Um, the main thing about staying sane in a Drupal project is managing your expectations on Drupal 7 end of life dates. <laughs> so I, uh, a few times I went to steering committees with my uh, tail between my legs having to tell them that uh, end of life dates had moved again. <laughs> um, okay, so let's wrap up. Uh, so you can see here that there's a practical side um, that Chris spoken about to projects and how you can stay sane. And then there's the um, human side, which I've shared. And I've, I've really realized that both have equal value. And it's really important to consider both as you go through the project. Overall, uh, the project was a success. Uh, Bonds learned to work in an agile way more effectively. We now have uh, CMS running on Drupal 10. We have a beautiful modern design. It's more mobile friendly and it's cloud hosted. We have more uh, stronger data integrations into our website that provides a comprehensive experience uh, to our prospective students. Uh, we have a functional backlog and we work closely together, together on it uh, day to day. 
Uh, we've learned a lot from this but, and become streamlined in how we work. So honestly, this is not some sort of TED talk for us, uh, but we wouldn't be sharing it if we weren't living it day to day. And we know that it's helped us get to where we need to get to uh, today. So uh, we hope that this has helped you learn, uh, learn, become more proficient in how you work in projects and how you work in your teams. And we thank you for your attention during this time. Thank you. Yes, a uh, huge achievement there. Um, great work, guys. So my question is, um, you mentioned something which is um, quite common, I think, and that in the design phase, when you started going into the implementation phase, you found that you hadn't really thought of um, some of the technical limitations or um, so on and so forth about the design. What do you think are, good, are some good ways or good learnings to avoid that in the future? Because I think that is a really common yeah, um, so th I think the main thing we learned is that you need to bring your developers on early. And from what I've learned, um, creative people and creative teams like to work in a certain way. I wouldn't say it's perfectly waterfall, but they like to go through an iter iterative process in their own. And what I've realized now is that you could adopt that to a sprint type model where you do certain elements of design, then build that um, into interfaces that you can test against and actually have practical content against. So that's one of the things that I would uh, recommend to people. Be able to have your dev team on, on board early and be able to iterate not just in design, but also in, uh, in development. My first question is, um, you showed us your uh, Jira uh, uh, swim lane. Yep. How did you deal with blocked tasks? Blocked things that's, oh, there was plenty of them. Um, I mean, the easy answer is they carried over sprint to sprint. Um, like, we've kept coming back quite a few times, but the program pages were a really large deal and a really big, it was difficult on this yep. project. You know, we needed to go to each faculty to sort out their different snowflake version of the program pages. I think really all that really means is they carried over. Um, there was a time when we had to stop work on that and shift it till later and just give it the consideration it needed to. Um, so to answer that question, they carried over and we sort of ended up with the project saying to Bond, look, you guys need to figure that out. We'll go work on something else for a little bit. And that's how we did it. How do we flag? Everyone knew. <laughs> <laughs> they would they would just roll over to the new to the next sprint. Yeah, yeah. we just move them out of the sprint into the next one. Just we, worth uh, challenging ideas. Uh, yeah. So there's always a right time and right place for challenging ideas. Sometimes it can be helpful. Other mm -hmm. times it can be damaging. So yeah. knowing that is also important. Yeah, I think the big thing for us is there wasn't really the whole one team one dream thing, but there wasn't really two teams working on it separately. Like we weren't. We were catching up as a team together, we were being silly in stand-ups, and that sort of made it a bit easier to understand when you know, they were working on something or as challenging or pushing back. Everyone got a bit more comfortable saying, you know, we wouldn't build it like that, don't do it like that. This would be a nightmare. Yeah. What university use agile processes in the future? Uh, we're trying to use it more and more. Uh, we have a very... Uh, what would I say? We're, we're used to working in a certain way, and I'm trying to push that a bit more. But, and I think this project has been good because it's demonstrated how we can work. But we're still learning internally um, how we can do that. So we're gradually picking it up, and uh, yeah, we'd like to use it more. Hi, um, I have I have a question about the uh, retrospectus. Yep. I've tried this in New Zealand a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Um, so let me just let me just tell you what happens in Germany. <laughs> Please. Okay. Um, so in Germany, you come in and um, you go in and everybody just goes, Wah! yeah. So yeah. everybody just 
get rid of it and then you have a solid discussion and also you all agree um, that uh, people can be angry and that needs to be worked. Um, when you do this in New Zealand, nobody says anything. There's just this cold, freezing silence. And I just sit there and I go, I deactivate my mic now. Because whatever I'm going to say now is not going to help. So how, how do you manage this in Australia? Are Australians very different? Oh, no, I don't think so. So early on the first few retros, even for myself, like I... It's hard to engage and, you know, be quite honest and transparent. But I think you had to, you had to warm up to the process. Um, what I would recommend is if we did have a difficult period during the sprint or something bubbled up during a stand-up, for example, would say, look, this is a really good point for the retro. So, like, sort of try and put pins in things throughout the sprint. Say, bring this up on Friday. Bring this up during the next catch-up rather than have everyone terrified for this meeting that's going to happen or trying to save their bullets for that session. Rather, just make it sort of a thing that's part of the process. But it definitely kind of like the whole thing. It didn't really happen overnight. We did get a lot better at it and a lot more comfortable during the process. So that's one way of getting better, maybe. <laughs>